While we're praying here before service, I want to have special prayer for Sister Bud. Sister Bud's a lot worse than we thought she was. And we don't have anything really conclusive yet, but we know, by the way, that's my hat on the front pew, so don't nobody get to wondering what to do with it. Uh, I put it there so I wouldn't forget it. Uh, but... Sister Bud's really, you know, she's really not doing well at all, and and uh, there's not anything that we're getting back from the doctors that sounds very good. So I know they would really appreciate us, you know, having special prayer for her. So if you would, let's ask God if He'd touch the doctors or touch her. God, help our sister, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, touch them, Lord, and help them during this time, Lord. Your comfort, God, your healing power, Jesus, if you would touch Sister Bud. Consider her faithfulness in her life. And I know we will need to accept your will, and we're looking at that, but we're just petitioning you if it, if it would work in your favor, in their favor you could heal her. Oh, God, we know you're more than able. Touch Brother Bud and Sister Bud and comfort them during this time. And touch the doctors. Oh, God, and help them. Oh, God, to be able to help her as much as possible. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, God, for your goodness. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God, while we're praying, let's ask God to touch Brother Staphus. Sister Reva's there with him, and he's just, you know, we're going to lose Brother Staphus, if uh, it looks like. And so let's ask God to help them, that family, comfort them. And, and unless the Lord does something miraculous, oh, God, touch that family. Sister Staphus, Lord, and Brother Staphus, God, Oh, God, help him right now, Lord. Let him not sustain any more pain than as possible. Oh, God, he cut him a Honda. Hallelujah. Touch him tonight. Sister Staphus and that family, Lord, and the assembly in Olathe. Touch him and help him during this time, Lord. God, we're trusting you. You're our shield. You're our buckler, our present help in the time of need. Our great physician, our trust, our hope is in you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. All right. God bless your hearts.
Um, God's really been dealing with my heart this week on something, and it's, in, in years past, I haven't really been faithful to it, and it, it's prayer. 
that no matter how big the storm is, no, ha no matter how big your problem is, if you just pray, if you ask God to help you, nothing's bigger than He is. He's always there for you in your biggest trials, your biggest tests. He, he'll put you through the fire, but it's nothing that you can't handle. Oh. I just, uh, in, in the past, I, I've wanted to pray, but every, every time I get up, I think, it's okay. I'll pray tomorrow, and I'll pray tonight, and the only time I actually pray is for food. But this year is the year I, I want to start. I want to get up every morning. And it, it, even if it's just two minutes, I just want to pray. Just, just two minutes. God deserves more than that. But two minutes of my time, if I can just pray. And I feel like I, I would do much better than I'm doing right now. I appreciate the Lord for being here tonight. And I just want to get up and tell him thank you for bringing me back here again. You know, uh, from Sunday all the way and then back here again safely. No harm. I get up and I praise God. So I'm going to let the Lord know how grateful I am uh, to uh, be here. I, I thought about this uh, that song made me remember that. Uh, but I thought about it earlier this week, but I remember when I was in uh, Los Angeles at home, and I remember I had this uh, big rent that I had to pay myself. And every time when the, uh, the lady that owned the house would come pick up the rent, it still bothered me because I, I didn't have enough, you know. And I was scared I was going to get put out and I'm going to be on the streets and where am I going to go? I was just worried uh, about all of that, just stressing. And so I remember uh, she ended up getting uh, someone else to come and pick up the rent. So I just knew I was going to be put out then because every time he came, I didn't have all the money. I was doing hair, but it seemed like I just couldn't meet the need, you know, and pay the rent and, and gas and light and all of that. And so every time he would come, and, and before that time, I'd be crying, stressed out, and, oh, Lord, I'm going to get put out, oh, God, just whine and whine and whine. And I remember so clear the Lord said, read the three little pigs. I said, the three little pigs? I thought that three little pigs, it didn't make sense to me then. But I said, well, Lord, I remember reading that in school, elementary. I'm old now, but I remember. I remember reading that in elementary. So I said, okay, I'm going to get the book and I'm going to read it again. And when I tell you about the first pig, they plan. They plan around what I think about in church. When you're sitting under the word, and listening to the ministry going forth, take it and apply it to your life, you know, and, and, and uh, work with it, you know. And, and when times come hard, you have something on the shelf to reach for, you know. And most of the time it's prayer. But I allow Nona to get in the way and cause me to stress because I, I guess I thought, well, if I do that, God would come in, you know, how you think that you can force the hand of God, you know, to uh, make things work if I cry. But the Lord just let me know, that man didn't care about them tears I shed. He didn't care about those tears, you know, just said, you do what you're supposed to be doing. Build your house right. Those three little pigs, the first one built, I think it was uh, hay, then uh, wood, and, and then and the wolf come and huff and puff and blow the house down. They run for a uh, covering. And then I would just cry. Every time he said something, he huffed and he puffed and he blew my house down. I didn't think about the Lord. I'd be crying and, and just 
why this and I'm sick of this and I'm tired of this and and why I got to go through this I'm tired of living like this and I should go back out there where I used to work and the Lord just let me know I sent those clients to you then when you had those clients I sent them to you so what makes you think that you'll have you know if you go back out there you're gonna have clients you know so I just appreciate God for that yes. that song you know instead of me crying about you know telling the Lord about this storm tell that storm about my God how big my God is when I finish reading the three little pigs you know then I realized how big my God was I'm telling you I stopped that whining and if I had it I had it and if I didn't I didn't the Lord let me know you do what you're supposed to do and I'll take care of that and he did he took care of it I appreciate God for the songs that uh, the um, singers sing. I appreciate those songs. Those songs will take you through the day, through the week. They'll carry you when things are low or you, you might not be feeling all that good. But those songs, I say those songs of Zion, come back. You know, uh, God will bring a song up and give you the strength that you need to carry you through that day. So I appreciate coming here. I appreciate sitting and, and listening to the word of God, working to apply that to my life, that my life may be more abundantly, get more like he said I could. I believe that. And so I do believe the word of God. And so I'm grateful. I'm glad to be in the house of God one more time. Praise the Lord. Well, this is our testimony. And nobody can live it but you. And the Bible said in the 12th chapter of Revelations that those people back there in the early church overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. We can't leave out the blood of the Lamb. That's uh, the, whole, the Spirit of God, the sacrifice that He made for us. I'm thankful for that today. Uh, I'm trying to, to uh, offer up my own sacrifice, but anywhere I fail, there's a sacrifice from my Savior that God accepts and imputes his righteousness to me, my case, until I get it worked out. As long as I'll keep working on it, as long as I'll keep striving to please him and dedicate my life to him, well, he'll, he'll count me worthy of, that, of his sacrifice wherever I'm missing it, you know, anywhere that I'm needing help. So I'm thankful for, you know, this walk. And then Brother Elisha was talking to us about prayer. I said Sunday that when you pray, that's when you are at your very best. You can't get in a better condition that when you get in sincere prayer with the Lord. That's when you, you know, you push all flesh aside, push everything out of the way and begin to ask God to help you, help whoever you're making petition for. And so <clears throat> I said you need that worse than God needs for you to pray. God knows your needs, but he needs your communication. He needs you to get in that condition where you, you have fellowship with him. You have a time of serenity and 
sincerity and and a time that you've pushed everything else aside. You have to work on prayer. If you, you know, every time you pray, your 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 mind will it'll stray off. And you ever get to feeling bad about that? You're talking to God, and then your mind strays off, and you get to thinking something else. You think, "My Lord, I'm petitioning the Lord Himself," and here I've got plumb off of you know like. You ever talk to somebody and they just stall out on you? You don't know where they went. Uh, I was in. I went in the bank today, and this guy was talking to the, a teller, and I could just tell she just went somewhere else in her mind. He was just talking to her. I said, "She's not listening to you." And uh, he looked at her, and she looked at me, and she said, "Oh, I wasn't listening. I was. I just, you know, my mind strayed off there." I can tell. She didn't have a clue what he was talking about. And, uh, of course, if he'd have been talking to me what he's talking to her about, I might have strayed off too. So it wasn't too important to me either, but <laughs> he was as important to him. But he wasn't the Lord either. And so I try to work on myself to to uh, focus when I get ready to talk to God. We're living in such a society that's so easy to to get uh, uh, distracted from whatever we're doing. It, you know, uh, I, my wife and I was in a restaurant uh, with brother and sister Bud on the way home from the meeting. They rode with us in our motor home because his was in the shop and they felt like she would do better if she could lay down or, you know, be more, maybe a little bit more comfort than she would be in a, in a car. But we stopped and ate and we were sitting waiting on our seats and my wife said, look, and I looked, everybody sitting there, do what? Was you in on it too? must have just put yours up. Anyway, everybody was looking at their cell phone. You know, we're living in a time, that thing is captivated. You know, if we're not playing a game, we're Googling something or answering an email or texting somebody or, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> it does, uh, we have to really work on, on, uh, discipline ourselves not to let it captivate our our every moment uh, but anyway I was glad to be at the meeting and uh, we had a, a good ministers meeting in in Brownsville and and uh, then I was really glad, glad to hear about y'all service uh, Sunday <clears throat> it made me wish I was here. I, I told somebody how good a service they had. They said they well, uh, they don't need you evidently. I said well I'm glad they can have a good service when I'm not there. And uh, I said that shows to me growth in the church. And so I said I'm thankful that they had such a good service. I thought uh Tonight that I would I want to I've been through this before but I think it's worth going through again. Uh, I want to give you some scriptures on the baptism of the Holy Ghost because it seems like God's dealing with this assembly right now about that. Uh, <clears throat> you know I think those of you who have the Holy Ghost and they're are grown to a place in God that other people may ask you questions about it, you ought to have these scriptures. And you ought to be able to take somebody through the Bible and show them that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is necessary. It's absolutely requirement <clears throat> for eternal salvation. And you ought to be able to go through these scriptures and see that. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, I thought I'd just go through it. Like I said, I've been through it before here, but you don't always get everything the first time you hear it. And uh, <clears throat> then there's always people that wasn't here when it was gone through. And so 
I enjoy it every time I go through it. So, and I've gone through it many times. I've been through it other places besides here. So y'all ought to be glad no more often than what you've heard it. I could tell it a lot more times than what I have here. But in Matthew, the third chapter is where I want to start. I'm just going to take you... I'm going to take you chronologically through some scriptures. I may go back and forth just a little bit, but <clears throat> but uh, you can mark these scriptures as we go in your Bible because uh, I don't have to look it up tonight. I've got it marked in my Bible so I can just go from scripture to scripture. But in the third chapter of St. John, I mean of Matthew, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is talking about John the Baptist. The first verse says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The scripture I want to go to is <clears throat> verse 11. Um, <clears throat> uh, he 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 actually said uh, some things before that. You can go back and read it, but but verse eleven is the one that we want. It says, "I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance." Water baptism is the baptism of repentance goes together. You 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 can repent, but you still have to be baptized in water. It's a requirement. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Uh, I've asked people before that, you know, people have been taught it's not necessary, it's a good gift. I've asked them if they said, you know, I don't have the Holy Ghost. I've asked them, why wouldn't you want what Jesus came to bring. If John said, I indeed baptize you with repentant, water under repentance, but there's another that comes after me. I'm his forerunner. I'm coming to introduce him or to, to uh, make room for him into this world, the Son of God coming, and he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. I won't go into fire, but a lot of people used to think, you know, that fire baptism was part of Holy Ghost baptism. In fact, where I came from in Pentecost, people used to stand up and say, thank God I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. <laughs> but fire baptism is a different baptism, and uh, it uh, fire baptism is, is a, a, a trial and temptation. And so, uh, you know, but, but, but that, I'm, I don't want to go into that tonight. I want to go into these scriptures on the baptism of the Holy Ghost because if you look at these scriptures in their <clears throat> succession, I think they will prove to you that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a requirement of the Bible. And so he said, He that cometh after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost in fire. Now in John 7, um, not John, I'm, yes, John 7 and 37, this is by no means a, uh, uh, exhaustive, you know, I'm not exhausting the subject with scriptures, but I'm giving you enough scriptures to where you should be able to see what I'm saying about it. In John 7, and if I was you, I would write in Matthew 3.11, I would write baptism of the Holy Ghost, and then I'd put John 7, 37 through 39 there. That will give you a link to go to from there. <clears throat> so if you hadn't started writing in your Bible, you need to get over that. You need to start writing in it. Wear it out. Then get you another Bible when you wear that one out and transfer all your notes over. <laughs> I know now we have phones and 
you know, I like that. I've got a Bible program in my <clears throat> my phone and in my computer and you know, that's got a note there and you can touch that note and it'll pop up and tell you what you've said in the note and show you the scriptures and you can touch the scriptures and it'll pop the scriptures up. So I like that. It's not, you know, in fact, I like that even better than a book when, you know, you can't touch a scripture on a book and it'll pop up and show you what the scripture says. You've got to write it out. But here in John seven thirty seven. Jesus said, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So here he's just stating that, you know, he's talking about uh, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. That out of your belly is out of your, you know, your inward self, out of your being. The water that uh, it's a it's a refreshing of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Water is depicted in the New Testament as the Spirit of God. Now here you could back up to uh, John fourteen. Well, not back up, but this this uh, scripture. I believe it's in John fourteen. Uh, that may not be the scripture I'm wanting. Yeah, uh, let's just go ahead and go to John 14, the 14th chapter, and mainly the chap verses 15 through 26, if you want to write in John 7, 37 through 39, if you want to write there in your Bible, Holy Ghost baptism, John 14, 15 through 26, that would be a good reference to go to. Um uh, um, but but let me here since you know let me elaborate just a little bit more on this because <clears throat> listen the entire fourteenth chapter of the book of Saint John is talking about the Holy Ghost. That's the whole message Jesus is giving to his disciples before he leaves this world. He wants them to know emphatically how important it is to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Remember, he told John, he told Nicodemus, is that in the third chapter of St. John? He said, you must be born again. Nicodemus didn't understand that, how a grown man could get back in his mother's womb and be born again. Jesus just told him, he said, I'm, you know, he that's born of the flesh is of flesh, and he that's born of the spirit is spirit. This new birth is a spiritual birth, and it's necessary. Listen to me a minute. Adam was born of God. God created Adam. Jesus, when he came to this world, he was born of God. No other person was ever born of God before Jesus came to this world. No one. Uh, every person was born of Adam. When you was born... Brian, you was born a sinner. You have to get the Holy Ghost. Uh, you're born in sin, shaping in iniquity, the psalmist said. And you're because you're born of Adam, you're not born of God. You're born of a man that fell and God put out of the garden, put out of fellowship with him and put the curse of death on him. That's what we're all born of. But God sent his son to come to this world to rectify that fall of Adam so that we could be born again. And that's why he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's why John said, I am baptized you with water under repentance, but there's another that's coming after me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. 
the Spirit of God. And uh, so here in, in, in John, the 14th chapter, he's talking to his disciples before he leaves this world. He talks to them in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th chapters, getting them ready for his departure, his dying on the cross, and finishing the work. And let me say this. What Jesus did that caused it possible for you and I to be born again, number one, he was born of God. He wasn't born of Adam. Jesus was not born of Adam. He was born of God. He was born also of Mary and got a human, he got a human nature, but he didn't get a fallen nature from Adam. He got, he got a nature from God. He wasn't, he wasn't, his nature wasn't corrupt. It was just a human nature. But he was born of God. And that's why we, we have to be born again. We've been born naturally, but we've got to be born again. Jesus didn't have to be born again. He didn't have to receive the Holy Ghost. He had it when he got here. Uh, here in, in John 14, let me just start in the beginning. It's not that uh, we... we we don't have to necessarily go through all of it, but it's not that big of a chapter. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Those statements right there in those first three chapters is talking about him coming back on the day of Pentecost and you receiving the Holy Ghost or his disciples that he was talking to, that they would receive the Holy Ghost. That word there, mansions, is the word Greek word mone, which means abode. In my Father's house are many abodes. When you receive the Holy Ghost, he abides in you by His Spirit. You're born of Him and He abides in you by His Spirit. And what He's saying here, in my Father's house are many abodes. You say, Brother Smith, it shouldn't say mansions. I think the translators would have done better if they'd have put abode there. Uh, they did translate the exact same word a little later, I'll show you, as abode or to abide. But... Here they put in my father's house or many mansions. They just didn't understand it. Uh, and he said, I go to prepare a place for you. That place, what he didn't have to prepare heaven. God didn't have to go to heaven and build a heaven for you. It's already there. He wasn't going somewhere to prepare a place for you to go to. He was, he was going to heaven to prepare a new covenant. Uh, and he said, I'll come again. He came on the day of Pentecost and to receive you as unto myself that where I am, not where I'm going, but where I'm at right now, being born of God, being a part of God's nature, that you could be there too. That's what he came to this world. That was his purpose for coming, was to come to this world and live in human flesh and do what Adam didn't do, overcome the sin life, the, the temptation of sin. Go through the process of being matured or perfected in the nature of God for your, your sin is, has been eradicated out of your life. You say, well, Brother Smith, that, that seems impossible. I know it. We believe in the impossible. We believe that it's impossible with man, but it's possible with God. That's why Adam was cast out of the garden because he disobeyed God, and, but he had more than you've got. Adam had, he, number one, he was born of God. Number two, he was in a perfect environment. And he had a knowledge to know better, and he had enough power to live above sin. And he willingly turned against God. And so <clears throat> Jesus came and finished what Adam, that's why he's called the second Adam in 1 Corinthians 52, 
he, he came to finish what Adam failed in. And he lived his life and went through all that he went through. What does the scripture say in Hebrews 2.10? I read it Sunday. It, it says, <clears throat> if you'll hold your place right here in John 14, let's read it in Hebrews 2.10. It says, for it became him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory. That's God. It was, he was for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus had to go through suffering temptation and his own mind, imagination, wanting to do his own will, not following God's righteous instructions. He had to go through those trials and overcome all of that. Through that, he was made perfect. And uh, that's why he came. When he came to this world, he came that he, he could go through that process and be made perfect and, and get, as a human, get, out, get sin out of his life. He didn't, ha he didn't give in to sin, but it's because he was born of God and God's hand was on him in such a great way that he was like Adam. He could live... Uh, in an environment and had enough strength from God to live above sin. But, and he came, and once he finished that, carried that sacrifice that he made for you and I back to heaven, God granted a new covenant that we could enter into through the baptism of the Holy Ghost Christ becoming our mediator and our high priest to fulfill what the Old Testament uh, actually, it was concealed in the Old Testament, but it was there. Paul's writings and Jesus' talking was all about what the Old Testament foretold about his coming and his purpose for coming. And so... <clears throat> He came here that you and I could have life, be born of God, and not just life right now. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you've got life unto yourself. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, but you've repented and you're trying to serve God, then you, you're like, the best way for me to explain it is like an embryo. You know, I mean, that's, I know I'm explaining something spiritual by using something natural, but it's like a child, an, a child in its mother's womb is alive. It's got life. But it has no individual life until it comes forth through the Spirit of God, through that rebirth. That little child doesn't have individual life until it's actually born and that umbilical cord is cut. You know, I, I'm made alive by faith. The, the, the Spirit of God that works in the church is working in my being before I received the Holy Ghost. And God, there was life in me through faith and, and through God's Spirit touching me. Here's what, we'll read it in a minute. Jesus told his disciples, he said, the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost has been with you, but it shall be in you. Let's, let's, let's go on and read here. In John 14, the fourth chapter, and he said, And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Now remember, he's talking to his 12 disciples. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, or how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father. Also, and from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. 
Philip said unto him, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long a time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip, that he that hath seen me hath seen the Father? And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not this? I am in, my, in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. He's talking about, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything my Father wants me to do. I'm, I've, his character's working in my life. He's finishing his work in me. When you've seen me, you've seen exactly what God my Father would be doing. He's in me. He dwells in me. And my behavior is that of my father because I'm born of him and he shaped me after him in his image. He does the works. Believe me that I am in the father and the father in me or else believe me for the very works sakes. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto, unto my Father. Uh, he, he's just saying, if you believe on me, you're going you're, you're gonna, to, those of y'all that, that receive what I'm doing and receive me in this new covenant, a lot more is going to be accomplished through y'all than what I've been able to accomplish and gathering up this, you 12 men and 120, that, that's this little church that I have, but once this new covenant comes about, everyone that believes on it and receives this, greater things are going to happen. And of course, we know, I mean, after the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people the first day was added, and the next day, 5,000 were added. That's what that new birth brought about far more than just what Jesus brought in the 120. Verse 13 says, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now he's talking to the 12 there. These men have been hand-picked and trained, and they were the chosen 12 apostles in God's divine order through Jesus Christ and so he gave them power. You can't, you know, I'm sorry, but you can't take this scripture and say, you know, that whatever you ask in God's name, he's going to do it. I mean, how many of y'all asked God to do things and he never did it? You can't use that scripture for you there. Number one, those men knew not to ask unless the Spirit of God quickened them to ask. They were careful about what they asked God. They saw Jesus walk by. How many people do you think Jesus walked by that probably were sick or had maybe a, a demon or devil and he never did nothing for them? But then he, they saw him touch other people's lives. He was led by God. He, he, he even told his disciples, if you go into a city and you're not received, kick the dust off your feet and get out of there. Because he said, you know, if people won't receive you, go somewhere where it's profitable. He was teaching them. You have to be led by the Spirit of God. You can't just go where you want to. You can't do what you want to do. But whatsoever you do, in my name, that's the key, in my authority, you're operating in my name, in the name of God the Father that's in me, that's working in you. If you do it in my name, if you're in the proper authority, then I will do it. And God will be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, look at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, 
For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but you see me. Because I live, you shall live also. He's talking about being alive by the Spirit, this new birth. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. By this new birth. Uh, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I'll love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas said unto him, not as scared the other Judas, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus said unto him, if a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him, and make our abode with him. There. That word right there, abode, is the exact same Greek word that's translated mansions in verse 1. And dwell, yes. It, those words that, you know, that the, the part you need to get, we will, me and my father will come and make our abode with him. How? Through the spirit of God's spirit. God. God's spirit of life. For you to be born of God, you've got to have his spirit. It's his nature. It's, it's, his, it's the life of God that you must be born of. You can't be born of man and overcome in a man's spirit a fallen man. You have a human spirit and then that's what's so great about God. He made us Individual, um, he made us with a, uh, what's the word I want? A free will, free moral uh, agent that you could, you, you can serve God or you can not serve him. He's not going to make you serve him. Now once you're born of him, he may, even maybe before you're born of him because of the prayers of your pa parents or, Maybe someone else that loves you enough that they pray for you enough that God's obligated to deal with you. And so he may, God may force some things on you trying to save you. But he will not force salvation on you and make you serve him. You have to make up your own mind to do that even after you're born of God. But you've got to make up your mind to be born of God. You've got to make up your mind. This is for me. I'm giving these scriptures so you can see now, where he said, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the world which you hear is not, uh, the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. That scripture you need. You need to know this Comforter he's talking about. It is the Holy Ghost. That needs to be plain whom the Father will send in my name, and he'll teach you all things and bring all things to you, your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. He said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You've got to remember, he's fixing to die. They don't understand that. They, you know, when he died, they, they thought they, the whole deal was lost. You know, they, they didn't, they didn't, they wasn't able to grasp all this at once. That's why we'll see here in a few minutes why Jesus went back to them and helped them get back on track of what they were called to do. So <clears throat> in John, where's that scripture? I'm wanting that scripture where, is it in the fourth chapter? Maybe in the fourth chapter of St. John. Let me just see right quick if it is. Yes, in the fourth chapter of St. John, I want to just mention this scripture to you, going back just a little bit. In St. John 4.14, 4, it says, But whosoever, Jesus is speaking here, drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst, but the water that I give 
him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Well, how can you drink a water that you'll never thirst again for? Even if, if that water is the Holy Ghost. What did he mean by that? I mean, you speak in, you're born of the Spirit. But if you go a while without speaking it, you get thirsty. You get thirsty for it again. What did he mean by that? What he meant by that was, you will, once you receive the Holy Ghost and you You've experienced it enough that you know you've got it. You've drank that water. You'll never thirst or you'll never say, I need to get born of God. You won't thirst for that. You'll know you've got it. You've been born of His Spirit. You've, that you thirsted for. Did y'all know every person, every human being out here is longing for something that don't know God and hadn't been born of God? You know what they're longing for? They're longing for that connection with their creator that's been lost. You can't make them happy. They can, you can give them millions of dollars. They can serve for billions of dollars. It won't make them happy. They'll never have peace in their life. What they're longing for, something, there's got to be more. There has to be something else. They're longing for that connection with their creator that's been lost. Once you get it, you'll never thirst for that connection unless unless you quit serving God then you'll have to go back and do your first works over but but if you keep serving God you'll never thirst for that not to be born of God again I get I get thirsty I want God to move among us I want to see a good move in the spirit but I'm not thirsty to get born of God I, I've been born of God I'm not I'm not thirsty for that but I do love that wellspring, that flowing, springing up into everlasting life. I love every time the Spirit of God moves among us and the Spirit, I get in the Spirit of God that begins to work through me, I feel life. I feel alive. God touching me. I love to see these children coming up here and, and praying for the Holy Ghost and not only children I don't care who you are, how old you are. I you know, told you I prayed for that old man. I've seen people in their 80s get the Holy Ghost. That just thrills my heart to see people, you know, that long for God, or maybe they didn't know about it. That man in the Dominican Republic, when he got the, that old man got the Holy Ghost, he was, I never seen anybody anymore any happier. He was tickled to death that he got the Holy Ghost. I know he didn't understand altogether what he got. Excuse me, I got ice in that drink of water and I can't swallow it all at once. Uh, anyway, let me go back. Okay, John 14. Uh, you might want to write there on the tw at the 26th verse, John 20 and 22, Holy Ghost Baptism. Go, go from there, see, to John 20 and 22. All right, verse 22. <clears throat> now this is when Jesus died and he talked to Mary Magdalene. You know, they came to his tomb. He told them to go tell his disciples that he was alive and Look at how important it was to Jesus. Now you'd have thought when he resurrected and he realized I'm a, I'm a resurrected, I'm alive, and I've resurrected from the dead. He was well aware he just died on the cross. He knew, he remembered everything that happened to him. But he resurrected just like he had prayed and hoped and had faith for. He resurrected there in the grave. What would that be like? What would that be like to resurrect in a grave Wake up, you know, before daylight, and here you've written, surely there's some angels there to give him a little bit of assistance. You know, they folded, somebody folded up his napkin, his head napkin. and, and uh, But anyway, instead of him saying, oh, I want to go to heaven right now and see my father. I've longed for this day. Do you know that's not what he did? He said, "Let me get back to let me let me get 
go, Mary, go tell my disciples I want to come see them. Tell them I need to talk to them. You know what he did when he went to see them? Look what he did. In the 22nd verse, said, and when he had said this, let me back up to, to uh, the 21st verse. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That was one of the last messages he gave them, how important it was for them to be born of God's Spirit. He resurrected from the grave, went back to visit them, and to tell them, I want you to receive the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them. You know, it was the breath of life. He, he, he was just, it was just, you know, a, uh, he just did that as a picture. I want you to receive this life I told you about. Whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they're retained. He, he was reminding them of some of the things that he told them they were going to do as apostles of the New Testament but they had to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost for this to work. They had to enter into a new covenant. Now look in Acts 1. I, I know you're familiar with Acts 1, you know, but that's the next verse. You start taking somebody through this and showing them what happened, you know, and getting them to look at the, 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 what the Bible says about the Holy Ghost. The fourth verse, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Jesus, this is Jesus. He, he hung around. Instead of going to heaven, he hung around with these guys to make sure that what he came to do was going to be accomplished. That they had to enter into this new covenant. They had to be born again of God's Spirit just like he was because you without this new this nature of god you could never be perfected in a human nature it takes god i mean i, I god's going to have to do something even to this body you know look at me i'm dying now sister grove's dying worse you know i'm giving in to you sister grove you're more dead than i am but I don't know that what I may still die before you. Nobody knows, do they? But, but what I'm talking about, God's going to give us a new body, a glorious body, like unto his body. And let me tell you this. If you don't make the bride and you make the new earth, you're still going to have to get a new body. It's a terrestrial body. It's not the same celestial body that the bride will get, but it's going to have to be a new body. Your body cannot take this life of God that's going to last forever. God's going to do something that's going to change that. It has to be. Uh, <clears throat> and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me, and John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive, the pow receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth, back there in that world. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These had to be angels from heaven 
which said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner, and ye shall have, as you have seen him, go unto heaven. So he, and, and really, I would have to say that that is a prophetical, symbolic language that was spoken to them there. I don't know that Jesus is coming back on a cloudy day, just like he left in. But he is coming back in clouds. Clouds prophetically and symbolically in the Bible represent, it represents second heaven. It represents, and Jesus, he did come back in the cloud of that New Testament church, a second heaven condition. See, it wasn't many days after that he came right back. He made his abode with them in that way. And then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. <clears throat> and y'all know the scripture of what happened on the, in the second chapter uh, I would say to go to uh, Acts 2, 1 through 39. Read it. I'm not going to read all of that tonight, but you all know what happened. They, they went in the upper room. They waited on the promise for the Father. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit, like a dove, landed on them and uh, as cloven tongues and they began to speak in tongues and made such a commotion that 120 people that people heard about it and it went on so long people went out to see about it those Jews that were there on the day of Pentecost for the feast heard about it heard them speaking in 13 or 14 different languages there from wherever they were from and knew they were Galileans, but they were speaking of the things of God in another language, and they knew they didn't know that language. And that's something you need to know about the Spirit of God. There's the gifts of the Spirit. One of them is uh, other tongues. Then there's another. The, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is unknown tongues. But they received the gifts of the Spirit. I mean, all, everything in the Spirit was working right there. And so uh, those men spoke in other tongues, another language that was understandable by the people that heard it. That, it's called cloven tongues. Cloven has got two parts to it, like a cow's hoof or a goat's hoof. Uh, it, the, the, you know, a clean animal had to have cloven, a cloven hoof. It had to have two parts. You got to be able to to discern good from evil. You there uh, there there has to be uh, two parts there. Also, that there is a uh, other tongues operating and unknown tongues. The Bible, Paul said, "He that speaketh in the unknown tongue speaketh to God." So you know when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, most people that receive it speak in a in a unknown tongue. When I came back to God, after I was in the army, Sister Smith was so sick, and God, God was after us and called us back, and we went to that revival. That night I, I gave out a message, somebody interpreted it, but there was someone there later when tongues was given out, she was from, uh, I believe somewhere in Africa, or, or, and, and she said, that, they spoke that to me. That's my language. I understood every word they said. And so <clears throat> that's other tongues. So the, the Spirit of God, you know, there's gifts of the Spirit, but this Holy Ghost I'm talking about is being born of God, and the Spirit can operate in you any way it wants to, but the, the, the sign is tongues. Uh, on the on the day of Pentecost, look. Let me read to you just in the first verse, about four verses. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, 
they, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house with where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. See, they spoke with other tongues because uh, if you read on down, you'll see where all these people, verse 9, Parthians, these are Jews that were there from these different areas. You see, when they were in Babylon, cap captivity, they didn't all move out of Babylon. They didn't all leave Babylon. And they didn't all come to Israel. But they went into Asia. They went down into Egypt. They, some stayed, like I said, in Babylon, Assyria. They, they, they were dispersed many places. Why? Because they were satisfied with their life was tied up. They'd been there 70 years. And so here they, some were Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt and parts of Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Ab Arabians. They said, we do all hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They, they knew, if you go back up to verse 7, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these speak, which speak Galileans, and how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we're born. So they were speaking. God was working a work there to reach these people, these Jews that God wanted them to, to receive, and no doubt they're part of that 6,000 that was born the next day. No doubt they're part of the people that came into that and the 5,000 the next day. Then they carried it back into their, their homelands and began to spread what happened about Jesus and the message about him and what they had received. <clears throat> of course, you know, Peter stood up and began to talk about John. Then people began to ask him. If you go to verse 33, it says, and y'all know the sound of a rushing mighty wind came and they, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues. Verse 33 said, Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, Jesus standing by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath sent forth this which you now see and hear. And then if you go down to, you know, verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what sh shall we do? Then Peter said unto the repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall, not maybe, but ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. See, the problem we have down here in Christianity, so many, so many preachers and churches don't understand the Word of God, and they've been taught wrong, and the message hasn't been for everyone. Repent of your sins, be baptized in water, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. You plant that faith in people, they'll look for it and believe it and they'll get it. Amen. But if you tell them, no, you, that, that's something past, we, we don't do that anymore, then, then you've taught them against it and they won't have faith for it. But the New Testament message was, repent of your sins, be baptized in water, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Look what he said. Verse 39, for the promise is unto you, it's to your children and to all that are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How can people miss that? Uh, I'll let you read, you know, I'll let you go ahead and read some of this. You know, you've, you're taking these scriptures. Now, if you want to mark right there, Holy Ghost baptism, Acts 8, 15. Let's go to the 8th chapter of Acts and the 15th verse. 
This is uh, when Philip went down to Samaria. Samaria was where the northern kingdom was and they had lost out with temple worship and started, had a false ministry. Do you remember Jesus met a little woman from Samaria, a little Samaritan woman at the well, and and she he said, uh, she she was he said, give me a drink. If you ask for me a drink, he that asks for me a drink will never thirst again. Again, almost the same scripture I mentioned to you. And he told her, he said, you worship what you know not. You know not what what you worship. We know what we were. He's talking about Judeans. Those those from Judea and Benjamin the the two southern tribes of Israel, they, they were still in temple worship being taught the old covenant, but Israel, northern Israel, had lost out completely. And Philip, the Spirit of God, you know, dealt with him to go down into Samaria. He went down there and started teaching and talking about Jesus. And <clears throat> here's, let's, let's start in... Uh, Verse, let's start in verse 12. It said, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. This guy was a, he was like a, a, a he, he believed in sorcery and all of that. He operated in voodoo and stuff like that. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Here, Philip went down there, baptized them in water. They repented of their sins. They believed and had faith but none of them received the Holy Ghost. Uh, Could they have received it? Probably so, yes, but Philip, there was an order. They knew that the apostles needed to come, and he knew that, that the apostles needed to come and establish that work. So here Peter and John came and began to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost for, verse 16, as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So don't let somebody tell you when you're baptized and repent of your sins that you get the Holy Ghost right then. That don't make sense with this kind of this scripture at all. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that whosoever I lay my hands on, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Peter said unto him, your money, let your money perish with you because thou hast thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. In other words, he rebuked him. Simon was a greedy guy that, you know, he, he wanted to be a big shot. And he, wanted to do, he wanted people to look at him that he had something powerful to do, you know. But they, they received. When Peter went down there, They repented and were baptized immediately. They sent the apostles down there. They immediately prayed for them to see if they'd get the Holy Ghost uh, for them to receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, Now look in Acts 10, verse 44. I'm trying to hurry because I know it's taking a little bit of time, but, but it, you know, it's warm in here. It's cold outside. Besides all this, it's better than the 10 o'clock news anyway. All right, verse 44 says, While Peter yet spoke with these words, and this is where, you remember where Peter, he's talking here to Cornelius. Cornelius was a centurion, a Roman centurion, but he was a proselyte to the Gentile, uh, uh, the Jewish religion, and Peter had received a vision up on the roof in Simon the Tanner's house, and God sent a sheet down loaded with, animals that was against the Jewish law for them to eat. It came down on the roof where he was up there praying. He had this vision. It opened up and it it had all these unclean animals in it. And God spoke to him and said, God said, rise and eat, Peter. 
And Peter said, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> he didn't believe that was God because he'd never, he'd been taught all his life as a Jew not to eat any of that. And he said, Lord, here's what he really said. He said, Lord, you know that I've never ate any unclean thing. God carried it back. He pulled it back up into heaven. Then it came back down and unfolded again. God said, Peter, rise and eat. There was all that unclean animals. He said, Lord, I've never ate anything unclean. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Call thou not unclean what I have cleansed. He didn't understand that. While he was there meditating, thinking on that, these men knocked on the door. An angel had went to Cornelius' house and told Cornelius, go to Simon the Tanner's house and ask for a man by the name of Peter and tell him that God told Cornelius that you were to come there and talk to him. So he went there. Not knowing, you know, he thought, man, I don't know what's going on, what God's talking to me about with all this unclean animals that I'm supposed to eat. And God telling me what he's clean, don't for me to call it unclean. What God was trying to help him understand was is that God was fixing to clean Gentiles, which God had never added into the kingdom until this new covenant. God had just been dealing with Jews through the law of Moses to bring this to the world and sent Jesus through uh, as an Israelite to come to this world and for him to finish this course, but then bring this back and give it to the whole world. Open it up for everyone. That was God's plan in the beginning. Thank God, saints. Thank God you were not born before Jesus came to this world, being a Gentile. You, you might have became a proselyte, I don't know. But chances are you would have never even been included into God's kingdom. You and I are blessed. We're blessed that this has come unto us. That we're part of this new covenant. That God opened it up to all of us. Now, look what he said. Uh, Peter, you know... Uh, in verse, let's, let's, start in, uh, let's start in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God see, had sent him there to go talk to Cornelius and his household. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he's Lord of all. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. Those that are quickened, by the way, as people's got the Holy Ghost, they're quickened in the life of God. And then those that are dead, with, they're not alive unto God. God, he was reaching out to all of them, those that he had already saved and they'd been born again, as well as those that hadn't been born yet. To him give, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How do you know? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. 
Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water? That these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry several days. See, Holy Ghost, water baptism and repentance is, is important. These people here was born breach, you might say. You know, little kids, they're supposed to be born head first. But sometimes a child's born feet first. These people got the Holy Ghost before they were baptized in water. <laughs> but it still was a requirement. It was a requirement to obey the scriptures and do what God had required and follow in with it. Okay, then... Uh, the 11th chapter. Let's go to the next chapter. It said, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard, all, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, that they were, that they were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou winnest in to men uncircumcised and ate with them. And Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them. Uh, he, he began to tell them about this big sheet that was let down, that God, you know, God had to deal with him, uh, uh, you know, to, to get him to consider what God was asking him to do. They weren't supposed to, as Jews, go uh, into Gentiles' houses and have fellowship and eat with them. But... He did because God dealt with him and he was trying to obey God. Uh, so, uh, anyway, he told them about all of that. Uh, what God had cleansed, call thou not common. Let's see, let's go on down. And, and then he tells them in verse 15, and as I spake, I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with the Holy Ghost, but you shall be baptized, I mean bab with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy, Most, Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was it? What was I that I could not withstand God? That I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, said, then, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So they understood right there that God opened this up to Gentiles. And of course it was after this that Paul was called an apostle to the, to the Gentiles. But then now go to Acts 19, 1 and 7. Let me try to... I don't want to go so fast that you're not going to get what I'm saying, but uh, now here, this is in Acts, the 19th chapter, and Paul, he goes, in, he goes to Ephesus, and he finds people there that uh, he heard that they were disciples. They, you know, they had received Jesus. So, uh, Let's, let's read verse, chapter 19, verse 1. It said, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? See, after you believe, the very first thing Paul wanted to know is have you got the Holy Ghost? Have you received it? And they said unto them, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto him, Unto John's baptism. And, he, and, and then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come after him, that is on Christ. He didn't go into all the details, but you, I've read it to you. John said, I baptize you with water under repentance, but you shall receive after me, he that cometh after me, baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. 
So what he was telling them was, whoever told you this didn't tell you the whole story. And when they heard this, verse 5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They weren't baptized in water, right? Because they weren't told or understood what water baptism was to point to, to point to Christ being born of him. And when they heard this, they were baptized over again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. How do you know it did? And they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. So here Paul went, found some people that, that you know, they were doing all they knew to serve God. He wanted to know. Now, have y'all received the Holy Ghost? He's examining. Have y'all been taught right? Are you sure, you sure you, you're in this covenant? Have y'all got the Holy Ghost? Well, we never heard about that. He said, well, then who in the world baptized you? Because they didn't tell you the whole truth. So, <clears throat> uh, I'll give you, of course, the scripture in, in John 3. I've already mentioned it to you. In John 3, 3 through 8, that's where Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And then uh, Romans 14, let me just give you, I'll just give you, you know, maybe one or two more scriptures here. Uh, Romans uh, 14. It says in verse 17, so it's for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of heaven. You've got to get the Holy Ghost saints to be a part of this kingdom. It's, yes, it starts off with faith. Yes, it starts off with repentance, water baptism. But Holy Ghost baptism is being born of God's nature. And I've gave you enough scriptures to absolutely prove to you that it was required in the New Testament. That I don't know how anybody could think that they could go to heaven and not be born of God. And you're not born of God until you receive it. Uh, let's, let's go to, to uh, John 3. Because maybe that scripture about Nicodemus, he says something there that... <clears throat> Um, let's just start in the first verse. So there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher. Come from God. For no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus said unto him, you know, Jesus didn't even, even relate to what he was talking about. You know, you trying to figure out whether or not I'm a big rabbi or, you know, rather not God's with me. Let me tell you what you need to hear. Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of spirit. That's what you're born of when you're born of your mama. You're born of water and the spirit of human life. She's got a water. Her, her womb is full of water, and that little baby's in that nest of water, and he's getting oxygen through an umbilical cord. He's not breathing through his mouth and using his young lungs yet. He's, he's, that's, that he's got to be born of that. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. I know some people teach us that's to be born of, of water baptism. That's not what that's talking about. Look at what he says. He, he, in, he finishes that talk by saying that which is flesh is flesh. And, and, and the question of Nicodemus was, how can I get back in my mother's womb and be born again? He's, he tells him. 
that which is born to flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and there, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but you cannot tell uh, whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone born of the Spirit. When you're born of God, you, 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 I, I can tell you when somebody gets born of God, it's like the wind blowing. When I hear them start speaking in tongues, and I see it's genuinely in them, I can tell you, <coughs> I heard the wind blow. I don't know where it come from. I can't tell you. I can't tell you how I got here. The Spirit of God came, and this person was born of God's Spirit. Lord. Hallelujah. And so I could give you some more scriptures. Bob gave you enough scriptures that uh, if you need that for yourself, take it. Rehearse it. Read it over. The Bible said, you know, blessed is he that meditates on the word of God both day and night. Said it'd be like a tree by, by the waters and it'll bring forth fruit in its season. God will, if you'll meditate on the scriptures and pray, you know, I think God's dealing with this church because some of these kids have been getting the Holy Ghost. Sister Janique, what are you doing with the Holy Ghost when I'm not here? How come I didn't get don't get in on it? Have you down in the floor rolling around? I didn't get the joy get the joy of all that. Well, I I I'll you do it again? All right. Thank you. That's what I need. Anyway, it's a beautiful gift of God. And you we all need it. This human fallen nature that we got from Adam, <coughs> it's never going to be ready for heaven. If you think you can go to heaven in the condition you're in without being born of God, you're thinking heaven's going to be exactly what's down here. Trouble, problems. But my heaven, there's no sorrow. There's no tears. There's no separation. There's no sickness. There's... Hallelujah. This place, all troubles removed. The, par the paradise of God has come back. Only difference is we finished. We finished our course. Let me tell you something. You can get back into the paradise of God where Adam was and where Jesus was by this spirit. This spirit of God can teach you. It can, you remember what he told his disciples? It will it will, uh, how did he say that? Bring to your remembrance the things that I've said. The Holy Ghost will lead you. It will guide you. You can be led of the Spirit of God. It, yes, it takes time to learn God and learn how to walk uh, in God's Spirit, learn how God works, but it's for all of his children. And it's glorious. It's wonderful when you, when you know the Spirit of God is dwelling in you and God's made His abode with you because you're His child and you've been born of Him and you're to overcome this Adamic nature and just become perfected in the human nature that's born of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. What time is it? 9.40. You can't say I didn't give you back all the time that I took away from you and let you go so early. You know, and then evidently that was just for this little crowd. We got a bunch of people gone tonight. You know, some people couldn't help it. Sister Reva, keep praying for her. She's you know trying to stay and help her mother and be with her dad and help the caregiving right there at this time. So we're praying. Sister Isabel was sick. Sister Durham stayed at home with her. She got a sore throat. Jacob and Terry, their kids have been running fever. They're all been sick two or three days. And so Jacob, he can't, he can't drive. He's, you know, he's legally blind. He can't see. So if Terry can't come, he can't come. So, you know, that's how that works. Then Caleb and Hannah, Caleb was working late this evening and he, you know, still trying to get through with his all of his schooling and everything. He's got this new job and 
he's really excited about that. I mean, I'm excited for him. But anyway, they they had an ox in the ditch tonight and couldn't couldn't get out. And uh, so different ones couldn't be here tonight. But yes, Brother Wallace wasn't feeling good. He he had texted me too. Sister Abraham called me. I didn't have time to listen to the voicemail, but I'm sure she wasn't. You know, she, she'd be here. And so pray for Jonathan. Let's get that in so that we make sure that she didn't get left out. I'm, she probably told me on that message, be sure to request prayer. So I'm telling y'all to keep him in your prayers. Yes, Sister Sherry's not feeling good tonight also. All right, uh, Brother Michael, yes. Okay, Sister Sister Angie Elder, keep praying for her. Got her name tonight, didn't I? <laughs> All right. Shake hands and be friendly. I'll see you. Sister Donna. All right. Let's pray right now for that and pray for, uh, who was it else? Sister Angie Elder and who else we just said? Sister Donna. Precious Lord, God, meet these needs, Lord. Touch these that need your touch, oh God. We're trusting and leaning on you for your help. Oh God, Sister Donna, Sister Angie Elder, and uh, Sister Anne's this need in her family. Oh God, touch them. Lord and help them work your will Lord we give you praise go with your people in Christ's name we pray we will have a work day on February the 2nd which is a Saturday we may go ahead and have a family night that night so we may get some of your sisters to come down and help us maybe in the afternoon to get a few things done and help us get ready for family night but anyway February the 2nd Pray for the Dominican Republic. Uh, I'm going there. See, I wouldn't tell this on Sunday because people that heard it, some of them wouldn't come when they knew I'm not here. You know, when the cats away, the mice play. But y'all are faithful because you come on Wednesday nights anyway. So I can tell y'all I'm, I'm leaving Friday morning for the Dominican Republic. And please pray for me because I've got 10 days of morning and night services every day that I'm gone. So when I get on the plane, I'm just going to let them pour me in my seat and just hope I sleep all the way to Atlanta. <laughs> but pray while we're over there. I'm, I'm praying about God give, showing me a place. I'm wanting to buy some land over and build a building over there in La Romana, a place where we can have our general meetings that we have over there. We do have a meeting scheduled for January of 2020 in the Dominican Republic. So Brother Painter's going to put a new list of the meetings up on our website. Anyway, Brother Michael and Sister Cindy's got a long drive home, and uh, Crafton's got a pretty good drive home, and the, the McGowan's have got a long drive home, and... Uh, Sister Ann and also uh, Brother Josh and Sister Amber too. I'm thankful for, for all these people who live a long ways off, Sister Wilson too, that are faithful to come. On They're here almost all every service unless there's a reason they can't be. I appreciate that faithfulness. Praise God. Shake hands and be friendly. I'll, I'll see you Sunday. I'll see you on the 1st. First chance I get. <laughs>